Okay, you're on. Oh, am I on? Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, this story that I'd like to tell or read to you is called The Widowmaker. And it's, uh, it's really the story of a tree and a man. And uh, it's an actual, everything in here is verbatim. It actually happened to me. Uh -huh. And it's a very interesting story. I'm going to read and then once in a while explain things when it's necessary to do so. Okay. So I'll begin. In the fall of the year, the migrating mule deer in the Sierra Mountains of California obey their instincts and tend to hold up hold up in their higher ranges until driven to lower levels by the first big rainstorm. The deer hold up to the high mountains, the mule deer, and they stay there until something drives them out, and that uh, is a storm generally. Mm -hmm. And they move out ahead, and then they move down to the lower levels. And of course the hunters all know about this, so we made our plans. Experienced hunters try to find a place to intercept set them on their way to their winter feeding grounds. We three hunters thought we had found the perfect spot it was a small scenic valley on Morgan Mountain, which lies on the slopes of Mount Lassen Peaks. A special attraction was a mountain spring with a running stream near our proposed campsites. And you know, it's very interesting. Mount Lassen is only 30 miles from here as the crow flies. But if you go to travel by car, it's about uh, four, four or five times further. Yeah, that's that's uh, Mount Lassen, Ted, is in uh, California, right? Northern California. Yeah, yeah. Mount, Mount Lassen Park. Uh -huh. Right in the middle of the little valley stood a huge white bull dead tree. It was a remarkable sight. It towered over 100 feet and was more than five feet in girth. It looked for all the world like a great white sentinel guarding its forest domain. You can see a lot of those old dead giants in the government forest. That tree entered our discussion around our campfire that evening. Who among us in this wildest imagination would have thought that one of us would be lying dead in this peaceful valley in one year's time. Well, anyway, getting back to those dead trees, they survived fires and, and all kinds of storms and drought. And then finally, when they get to be a great age, they, they're completely beaten by a tiny little beetle. And that's the way their life has ended. And they stand there for hundreds of years sometimes, naked in the woods, in the forest. It's a beautiful sight to see them. We were, we were unlikely trial of hunters. Bud, our eldest, was, a, was 65 and quite gray. Thin, thin and tall, he was a scholarly type of person and habitually wore a look of tired patience on his face. To his, true to his appearance, he was a great reader of books and a collector as well. Jim liked to call him the professor when he was talking to others. Now Jim, our youngest, and married only a year, was the prime mover of our trio. He was full of dreams and ambitions. He kept Bud and me humping to catch up. We never have to worry about being late with Jim around, Bud said. Jim done the lion's share of our camp duties and cheerfully give his best for anything needed. 
What can I say about myself? I was 55 and still young, or so I thought. To me, hunting was a chance to break the routine and enjoy the wonders of nature. Today I am 83 and cannot imagine that I'm reaching the end of the line. Well, this was seven years ago, so I, I haven't got to the end of the line yet. How old, <laughs> how old are you, Ted? Yeah, well, I was, yeah. I cannot believe that I am reaching the end of the line. Too much left to see and to learn and too little time left. We three did have something in common. We worked in the same trade and for the same construction company in San Francisco Bay Area. We also liked hunting for its escape to the wilderness, the serenity, and the chance of being alone, and the smell of bacon coffee on the frosty morning. These are the true lures of the hunter. Or fishermen, too. But anyway, I gotta stop for a minute and talk about the company we worked with. We were all bricklayers, but we worked for a refractory company. And uh, we, we installed uh, fire brick into boilers and ovens and uh, different things that had to have something with a lot of heat to protect. And uh, this kind of work is a miserable kind of work to start with, and it's hard work, and it has to be precise. And that kind of work see, has a tendency to draw workers together to a common fold, so to speak. And that's why us three really got acquainted and found that we were dyed-the-wool hunters. Uh, so anyway, the first night around the campfire, Jim asked Bud about the big tree. How old do you think it is, Bud? And what killed it? Taking his time, Bud said, well, from the size of it, I would say it's between 400 and 500 years old. Probably a Douglas fir. It was twice as high as what is left of the trunk. Probably lost its top in some storm. You would have to count the, the rings to find its real age. The growth range determines its true age. As to what killed it, well, the worst enemies of men and trees are the small things. For man, it's disease germs, viruses, and for these big conifers, it's moths and beetles. Actually, billions of these young beetles hatch out on a tree and literally starve it by sucking out its life-giving sap. Jim says, what a rotten deal for the trees. They can't fight back. Funny, there isn't more dead ones around. But reply was, no, it's not such a thing. It's nature's way of controlling growth balances, and only a small percentage is taken each year. Well, anyway, Jim concluded, its old age and its size gives me a feeling of its strength and security. But answer was, I don't know about the security part, you know, Jim. The lumbermen call these old dead ones widow makers. They clear them out of their work areas. I don't remember anything more said about the tree. We, were, we had more important things to discuss, like a hunting plan for the next day. It was a day later that Jim got his brainstorm, and it was a corker. He informed us he was going to, to build a small pole cabin right here in the valley by this great big dead tree. Our next hunting season, he would bring his wife, Marie, on the hunting trip. 
At first we tried to talk him out of it, but came up with, he came up with an answer to every argument. The highway was only a mile away as the crow flies, and he knew where there were large pole pines just the right size for the framing. He would drive up weekends, four or five trips would do it. Bud made his final plea, Jim, your wife Marie is a city girl. She will feel insecure in the woods and lonely when you are hunting. And with the pests and no conveniences, she will be unhappy living here for a whole week of hunting. Lonely, Jim replied. She will have the cabin to take care of, books to read, and the radio and preparing of meals. It will be a break from her job. She will learn to love the woods as much as any of us hunters. We went along with the project. I even drove my pickup up one weekend, hauling up some tin and plywood, and yelp with uh, Jim with uh, the raisin, as he called it. Jim, Jim got the cabin finished before the next hunting season. It was eight feet by 12, the door, one door and one window, and sided with plywood. The roof was tin, it was light and waterproof, and that's what counts, Jim said. It's not much for pretty, but hell for strong, as we say in the brick-laying <laughs> brick trade. <laughs> in the fall, Marie took a week off from her job and uh, accompanied the Safara, as she called our hunting trip. She proved to us from the very start that she was a good sport. She never complained about anything. She even accepted the pesky wasp, the pesky wasp and deer flies. I gotta tell you about those deer flies. Uh, they'll land on you and they don't sting, they bite. And if you don't swat them and knock them off or kill them, they'll give you a bite that you'll never forget. They'll just stay right there and keep biting. And you just, the only thing you can do is swat them. Swat them away. Well, anyway, she took up, she put up with them and, uh, and uh, with, with the, uh, ants too. There was always ants all over every place, crawling in and out and all around the place. Ants is something you can't get away from, no way. Going up, wait, wait a minute now, wait, I gotta get this, this thing straightened out here. I don't know where I'm at here now. Oh, she said, uh, she was talking about it. And she said, you know, I can hear the trucks and cars going up to Morgan's Pass. And she said, that gives me a feeling that people and civilization is close by. That made her feel a lot better, I guess. The storm that we hoped would move the deer herd down to our valley came on the last day of the hunt. Well, we got a, it got too late to give us a shot at that prize buck we were after. We saw a lot of does and fawns. See, they come ahead of the storm, and then the ducks, the bucks hold back, and they come later. Not even a spikehorn buck did we see, that young male deer. It looked like another goose egg. The storm was a mixed bag of thunder and lightning and rain mixed with snow. Wet and feeling miserable, it didn't take Bud and I long to call it quits. We packed up our wet gear and prepared to leave for home. Jim and Marie planned to on staying one more night in their tight little cabin and warned Jim 
about the possibilities. No, Bud warned him about the possibilities of the snow becoming too deep. And Jim assured us that he had changed and he would leave before it got too deep. In reconstructing what happened afterwards, we have only the account from Marie. She said that when night fell, the wind started coming in sudden gusts, and she was afraid it would blow the roof off. But Jim assured her not to worry. The wind would blow itself out and they would have a good day tomorrow. We reasoned that with the wind coming in sudden gusts, it must have set up a rocking rhythm between stress and slack, building up to higher pressures until finally breaking the ancient fibers right at the base of the trunk. The huge tree fell swiftly and silently. You see, the gusts of wind coming suddenly that way would start a teetering back and forth. Uh -huh. And the more it teetered, the, the further it teetered, until finally the strain put on the base where the bottom of the trunk was, just snapped off. And that's probably exactly what happened. Marie was at the door. Marie was at the door and of the cabin and had just finished washing and packing the dishes for the trip home. In the rear of the cabin, Jim was lying on the bed. At first she thought lightning had struck the roof. There was a terrible crash and the floor shook. And she turned in shock disbelief. The gas lantern swinging wildly on its nail by the door cast its light on the demolished end of the cabin. Snow and rain struck her in the face. Where the bed should be lay the great white trunk of the tree. Only Jim's boot protruded from under. The shock, terror, and helplessness struck her with an overpowering force. Marie panicked blindly into the storm. Into the storm tossed woods. She collided with rocks and trees, and but Marie soon came to her senses and began to face the, face the crisis calmly. That's generally true with Penny. The shock hits you so quick, you just don't know how to handle it. The only thing you want to do is get away. And that's what happened to Marie. Then, then she got to thinking, well, now here I'm in trouble, and I've got to get out of it. So her first, she thought of the car keys. But, the, but Jim Rice kept them in his pocket. Then she thought of the highway, but which way? She forced herself to listen, and over the noise of the storm, she could hear the truck grinding up to the pass. And to each one of us is built a hidden giant of strength that emerges under extreme stress to perform heroic efforts to save ourselves or to rescue others. And so, Marie moved toward the highway in utter darkness through the rugged terrain of the mountains. Now, you know, it's funny about that, but people don't realize there's a superior strength like that until they read an item where a woman lifts some terrible weight that she never could lift. But under the stress of the occasion to save somebody's life, she does it. And this is exactly what Marie did in facing this utter tribacity of trying to fight her way through that forest in the, in the darkest night through the rugged terrain of the mountains. She later told us, no, she, no, she later told us that she had groped her way and forward to rest 
And then by listening for the sounds of the cars going up the pass, she would correct her direction. As weary hours passed, the sounds grew louder and she changed directions when they varied. No one knows how many hours it took, but at last bruised and scratched, and on the point of complete exhaustion, she crawled up the gravel, she crawled up the gravel onto the highway. It was on a high grade. Some travelers took her to the little town of Mineral, where a doctor was available and where the rescue squads and other authorities were notified. This mineral was over the top of the pass and about three miles, three or four miles further on. So it wasn't too far away uh, that, they, that she could get help. But uh, they, everybody was notified and they went, authorities went to work on it. Bud and I had guilt kind of feelings about the whole thing, as people always do who were involved in a tragic accident. We felt we didn't give Jim enough warning about the possible dangers. But as Bud put it, no man can foresee or do anything about events that are meant to be. Well, I kind of had to accept that. It was the last hunting season for Bud. He passed away three years later. I hope he found that happy hunting ground he often mentioned. I tried hunting the next year, but it seemed the old zest was gone. I still love the forest and visit it often, but my equipment is only my camera and binoculars and a fishing rod. It was on a fishing trip five years later that I visited our little valley again. It looked very much the same, except for the scattered pieces of rusted tin and plywood lying about. And there stood the pole, the pole skeleton of Jim's cabin. The huge trunk now rotting, lying across the smashed end. There was a slight depression, apparently, where they had dug out Jim's body. On one of the Large pole uprights on a nail swung Jim's metal cup. We had a drink out of that metal cup <laughs> just before that storm hit us, Bud and, and Jim and I. I left it there undisturbed, but I couldn't help thinking that if that cup had reason and been made of more durable stuff, it should certainly smile at the short destinies of the man on the tree. <laughs> now the tree, now the man could get killed any time, but the tree, the most that he could get out of it was about four, four or five years. 500 years, I mean. Four or 500 years. Four or 500 years. Yeah. So that's short compared to the metal, which has been here millions of years. Yeah. <laughs> so the cup is, the cup has got the seal. Well, that's it, Joe, for that story. Okay. I hope everybody enjoys it as much as, as I did living it. And every word is a true fact. It really happened. Well, this story that I want to tell is about the uh, my reputation. I was an ordinary little kid. Most boys are, when they, especially if they have eight older sisters, because that gives you plenty of reasons for being ordinary. <laughs> there we go. Yep. But anyway, I've been playing ticks, uh, tricks on my older sisters, along with my brother, Paul, and uh, we had become quite expertise at it. And we figured we were pretty good at it, as a matter of fact, uh, one time we put the bells, cow bells, on a on a prospective brother-in-law's car, and it, and my dad thought the cows had got out of the yard and was running down the road. It woke everybody up in the house. 
But anyway, till he stopped and took the pills off. But anyway, uh, my sister Vernie had got a boyfriend. So my work was cut out for me. And at that time, I didn't have Paul to work with me, so I had to work on my own. So anyway, uh, Frank come to visit her, and he seemed to be a pretty nice guy. But I thought, well, he's just as good as any of them to play a trick on. So I went out, and I started to work on his car when they were par parked out in front of the house. And uh, I started to tie some cowbells on. But I had forgot to stop the clappers from ringing. And one of them hit the side of a bell, and Frank heard it when he was sitting in the car. And he boiled out of that car like he wouldn't <laughs> believe. And I turned around, and he was parked in front of our Titan tractor, which was about 30 feet back of him, off to the side of the road. So I ran and ducked under that tractor. And I thought I'd be safe under there. He'd never find me, because it was pretty dark. And uh, he reaches in anyway, and he got a hold of my shoulder, and he yanked me out. <laughs> and I wouldn't have mind anything that he'd done. He shook me a little bit, but his fatherly advice is what really hit me bad. I couldn't hardly take that. He said, uh, you're too old a boy. And guys, yeah, I was eight years old and was proud of myself, you know. He said, you're too old a boy to be playing tricks like this on people. <laughs> and he says, I want you to stop it and not do any more of it. And uh, I just w went away from there, slumped over, and I felt terrible. My whole reputation was at stake, see. <laughs> I was exposed to the world, and I felt terrible about it. And I thought, well, I'm going to get even with that Frank boy if it takes the rest of my life. Well, it happened pretty quick. The very next day on Friday, Mabel, Bernie's uh, best friend and cousin, showed up with a new husband. And his name was uh, Reading. What's the first name? I can't think of his first name, but it'll come to me. The last name was Reedy, but anyway, he was a big person, a big guy, but he had a smile on his face that seemed to never leave. He was smiling all the time, and I thought, well, I'll be able to get along with him all right. So they came for a two or three day visit, and uh, meanwhile I was waiting. Now Frank could be along about Friday night. That's when he'll come spooning for uh, Vernie again. So I got to get set for him. Oh, his name was Harvey, that's right, Harvey Reedy. And uh, so I, I got Harvey aside and talked to him and found out that he was tickled to death to talk to me, you know. And he gave me a little boy talk, you know. <laughs> and we talked to each other. And so I confided in Harvey and told him about Frank being Bernie's boyfriend, and how he shook me up and and caught me and shook me up and everything, and I I made my plans pretty plain to uh, to Harvey, and Harvey says, okay, Teddy said, let's let's go ahead with it. So I told him what I wanted to do. When they were they were parked out there spooning, I wanted to ride up to the car and arouse Frank and get him to chase me. And then when he chased me, I'd run under the tractor again, and Harvey'd be there to welcome him. <laughs> and Harvey, he could see the funny part of it is, he liked to joke, you know. And I think he was bored anyway because he had to go to his relatives on his honeymoon. Yeah. And he didn't like that too much. <laughs> so a little excitement would help things along. <laughs> so. So here they, here they piled in on us. Uh -huh. Well, Frank and Bernie, and uh, oh, they started shaking each other's hands and pounding each other on the back and going through meeting and your own greeting and all this kind of stuff. And I was bored with the whole thing, of course. <laughs> but I put up with it. I figure it'll end someday. 
they got to congratulating each other and slapping each other on the back. And, and uh, then Frank and Bernie went out to their car to do their spooning. <laughs> and old Harvey winked at me, and we slipped out the back way. And we went down through the orchard and out onto the road, and it was already getting pretty dark. Couldn't see very far. But we could see the tractor, and we got up to the tractor, and I showed Harvey where he could sit between the front wheel and the rear wheel, and under the flywheel. Plenty of room for him to squat down there. And you know, Harvey, there was an interesting thing I didn't say to start with. He was a big person. Well, I think I'd said that he was big. But when he come into the room and sat down with everybody, it seemed like he filled the room up. You've seen people like that. They, and everybody kind of scoots back in case he got up to go someplace, so they'd give him plenty of room to get out, or wherever he's headed for. <laughs> but anyway, he was big, you know. Uh -huh. So anyway, he's, he was able to fit right between the wheel just right. Uh -huh. I set him down. And then I went back up ahead to Frank and Bernie's spooning in their car, and I picked up a bunch of little stones about the size of a wallet, and I started throwing those stones at the car. And I'd hit it on the front, you know, and on the side, and I only got three, three of them thrown, and that Frank reacted fast, boy. Out of that car he come. So I tore for the tractor. And again, he was right on my heels. But when I got the tractor, I sneaked in behind Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> and he hit the ground. And Frank come up, and he reaches in and grabbed Harvey by the shoulder, and he said, I got you. <laughs> and Harvey didn't say a word. He just rose up and towered over Frank, and he looked like a great giant arising from the dismal swamps. <laughs> and Frank was so startled, he said, oh, he says, is that you, Harvey? He said, what are you doing here? Harvey says, well, Frank, he said, I'm just looking over the tractor. <laughs> I wasn't just laying down on the ground. I was on the cloud nine. I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> after after that, I got to be the best of friends with Frank, and he got to be my favorite brother-in-law, as a matter of fact, in later years. But right at that time, boy, it was a great satisfaction. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that's the end of it. I'd like to relate a story that happened back in the Depression days when we were, I and my wife was first married, and it was such a, a very important thing to me. I managed to keep a diary of everything that happened, and I'm glad I did because I wrote the story from that. It's all factual, everything happened just as I wrote it down in my diary every day at the end of the trip. This was back in the hobo period when the Big Depression hit us. And uh, very interesting, the people that was traveling across the country, displaced from work and homes and everything else, and trying to find a new life for themselves. And it happened right at that time. And it's very interesting because so many things related to hobo travel happened in this trip. It's just one of those things I get. Now, I'm going to begin the story. When you're married at 16, four years is a long time to be separated from your family. Erna was homesick. Her parents and younger brother and sisters lived in Grand Haven, Michigan, 750 miles from our home in Denison, Iowa. It was August 1933, 
and we were in the middle of the Great Depression. It was impossible to see how we could afford the trip in the foreseeable future. What little money we could scrape together went for food and rent, and we never seemed to have enough. I remember our rent was $8 a month, and we thought that was a terrible price to pay. And I was always back on the rent. I never could get, get, get caught up on that rent. We lived near the railroad tracks in one of three flats that was formerly housed a bowling alley. They took this bowling alley and divided it up in three flat apartments and then rented it to people. So we rented one of those flats. The windows rattled, it was right near the railroad. The windows rattled when the trains roared by. At night, that was the double track of the Northwestern Railroad. The main track of the railroad going west to Denver and California. And the windows rattled when the trains roared by. At night, we could hear rats running around in the garret. One of our neighbors swore that they held races every Saturday night, running from one end of the cable to the other. <laughs> My friend and I, Loyal Johnson, was engaged in organizing the unemployed and farmers around the state. We traveled mostly by freight trains to meetings. I guess that's how Erna got the idea. She said she saw an entire family riding on a bo in a, in a boxcar one day. And there was no reason we couldn't go to Michigan to visit her family. Knowing the difficulties, I tried talking her out of it. Now here's something. One loose handhold and a slip meant death under the wheels. I was traveling back to Davenport at an unemployed com convention of the, of the state. And I was going as a delegate, I and Loyal Johnson. And along the way, we picked up a young fellow going the same way, young red-headed guy. And uh, we were traveling together on the train. Well, this one time, I was coming out of Boone, or one of those towns, I can't remember exactly which one it was, and the freight train was moving pretty fast. And at the head of the car, I grabbed the steps, and it must have been going a pretty good lick of speed because my feet, he hit the side of the boxcar. So that shows the force that it was traveling when I grabbed on. And I looked back at, the, at Red, and he had grabbed the rear end of the caboose, which is a taboo. The old hobos always tell the younger guys not to grab the rear end where there's the ladder don't go clear up. There was only one ring on it, one rung. And he grabbed over that rung, and as the train jerked him, but he switched around the corner, and the last I seen was his hands being sprung loose from that hanger, right down between the rails. Well, we never knew what happened, but we knew what happened. That's one of those situations. No doubt at all, he was cut to ribbons. But anyway, I knew the dangers, and that's why I tried to talk my Erna out of it. I tried talking her out of it. One, one loose handhold and a slip meant death under the wheels. We could be kicked off the trains and arrested by railroad detectives. But she had made up her mind. The hardest part was leaving our two little girls, Elaine four and Joanne three, would have to stay in the safe hands of their grandmother. We packed a suitcase with clothing and one letter telling of Verna's mother's illness. That was the letter that would give us an alibi for traveling. It wasn't true necessarily, her mother wasn't ill, but it would work good in case it was needed. And that most important document, our marriage license. We had $2.50 for expenses. 
At 4 p.m., we boarded an Eastbourne freight. We both wore overalls. In those days, overalls was the best thing to wear because you didn't have to undress to do your necessarios. <laughs> so all you had to do was drop them. They used to say, just drop and squat. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, anyway, uh, we, uh, after 90 miles, we arrived at Boone. That was the division headquarters for the Northwestern Railroad. And we arrived there just at sundown. We made easy conversation with an old hobo cooking his supper near the track. He looked every inch as a skinny Santa Claus. His face almost obscured by his beard, white beard. He wanted someone to talk and invited us to have a bite with him. He said he was called Denver, Denver Sam, and he was a true knight of the road. He, he didn't judge, he didn't jungle up with the others, but carried his own cooking equipment. Independence was his coat. We praised him for it, but in our minds knew the irony that the poor old fall was most dependent on the railroads for transportation and for good people for handouts. He offered us some black tea, apologizing for no sugar. He was frying pancakes in an old skillet. He said it was kind of tricky without grease. He poured a little batter in the pan and with a not too clean stick, smeared it around, explaining that it had to be thin for it only cooked on one side. After scraping it into a tin plate, he offered it to Erna. She wasn't hungry. So I ate it, ate it and thought it good. I guess everything tasted good to me in those depression days. We slept in a boxcar on a siding that night. The next morning, the next morning we were up early and started walking towards the end of the railroad yards. This is where the train comes out of the, onto the main line. It was a boarding place for transits. See the, the, the side tracks inside of the yards was where they made up the freight trains. And then as all they came out, they turned the switch and they got on the main line. And right at that point, the hobos had their jungle. And there was always a bunch of hobos gathered around with the pots hanging in the trees or being used by those who were still cooking their meals over the fires. Well, anyway, a middle-aged man come up to us and ask if he could walk along with us. We thought an odd request, but welcomed his company. He was dressed in ordinary clothes, but his seedy jacket looked like it had just come from the laundry. There were no telltale, telltale soot smears around his eyes and ears. He, he was no freight train rider, that was for sure. We talked about the usual things as we approached a group of about 20 hobos standing in the jungle near the tracks. Apparently they had finished breakfast first. The newly washed pots and pans were hanging, were hanging from the branches of the trees, awaiting the next new customers. We noticed another man coming from the other side. Suddenly, two men broke from the main group and plunged into the hemp weeds that grew alongside the tracks. I knew friend yell Hawk and pulled a gun, firing over their heads. We never heard if the two detectives caught the fugitives. I hope they didn't. We didn't like being used as decoys. Now, you know, I often think about them hemp weeds there. They grow six feet high, and it was like a jungle. They were so thick. And among those, at least 50% of those was marijuana plants. 
marijuana hemp. And I, at that time, nobody knew about marijuana. That would have been one happy cap if they had. <laughs> because that jungle stretched for, it looked like for miles along the track. We rode in a clean gondola car that day. This was, this gondola was an open coal car. And if you stood in the front, it broke the wind, and you got a good look at the country as you rode along. Eating was a simple affair. We would buy a loaf of bread. Generally, that cost 10 cents. And a hunk of bologna for 15 cents. And then you could travel many miles on that purchase of this simple fare. We finished our sandwiches, and I started to throw away the last two slices of bread. A young black man who shared our gondola said, if I was going to throw them away, he would like them. I told him they were getting hard and dry. He pulled a twist on Marie Annette by saying, Mister, they taste just like cake. <laughs> Feeling sorry about his acute hunger, I ordered him a dime. I offered him a dime for my meager budget, but he refused to take it, saying we were two mouths, and he had only one to feed. You know, Marie Antoinette was that poor little princess gal, and during the French Revolution, when people were shouting for bread, she said, "Well, if they don't have any bread, give them cake." Right. <laughs> Let him eat cake. Later, this poor little girl lost her head with the gullotine. But anyway, that's another story, isn't it? In the mid-afternoon, we arrived in, in Clinton on the Mississippi, on the Mississippi River. And then, with no trouble, hitched our, our ride 60 miles downriver to Davenport. That night, we stayed with friends who were active in the unemployment movement. I spoke at a mass meeting and told them of the conditions and our activities on the other side of the state. Some seemed to feel assured that it was just as tough with us as it was for them. The depression didn't overlook any particular area. <laughs> and that's the truth. The next morning, we tried hitchhiking across Illinois. There was few cars on the road, and those who passed were filled with people, dogs, chickens, and furniture. We only made 60 miles that day and, was, and acquired some blisters on our feet. I don't know the same name of the little town we limped into that night, but it was important to us for it had a railroad. Within an hour, the eastbound freight pulled in, and we were off to Chicago. We made, made, we made love that night in our private boxcar. When you are young and fatigued, when you are young, fatigue has little effect on sex. We got to Chicago about sunup. It was a long walk from Proviso Yard to the streetcar line and the blisters didn't help. With our soot smudges, we caught only a few curious glances from Chicago commuters on our way to Whiting. Well, that trip to Whiting on the south side was about 25 miles, and it only cost us a nickel apiece. So that's pretty cheap transportation. We wasn't kicking about that. A Mexican woman was hanging out her wash near the tracks. We asked if we could have a drink of water, and she invited us in her home, which was an old box car with the wheels removed and, uh, and windows added. Many pretty flowers surrounded it, and we were the neat and roomy than you would think. She insisted on sharing her soup with us and talked about her husband, whom she loved very much. He was a section hand on the railroad crew. She offered to make sandwiches for us, for us to eat later. It seemed that people who have very little 
are the most helpful to others less fortunate. Now, this is something interesting. An engineer dismounted from his locomotive and walked over to where we were waiting by the switch. He asked us where we were going, and we told him Grand Haven, Michigan. He said, well, that's my train you want. Then he took us down the line and opened up a boxcar that he said was newly cleaned. We thanked our generous host, and we're soon off. That was the Pier Marquette Railroad. I don't think that exists today. I know it don't exist. Yeah. The kindness of that Pier Marquette engineer has been a lifelong memory. In a later stop, a brakeman informed us that the train was going to Grand Rapids, so we would have to get off at a little water stop near Pawpaw. That's Pawpaw, Michigan. We got a ride to Holland where Ernest phoned her father who came and picked us up. We spent one half of our budget, a dollar and 25 cents. We stayed two weeks at Ernest, folks. When we left, her dad gave us 50 cents. He was not working and needed every penny for his big family. Grapes were ripe when we started back and at every railroad stop, vineyards and orchards lay along both sides of the track. We loaded up on fruit and even got free cider from the mill. It didn't take long to discover that constipation was not a problem for <laughs> itinerant travelers through southern Michigan during the fruit season. <laughs> no, sir. We went to see Ernest sister, Alice, in Chicago. She was working but took the day off to take us to the World's Fair. That was the 1933 World's Fair. There were many new and wonderful things to see, but the greatest impact on me was waiting in line 20 minutes to urinate and then having to pay five cents. <laughs> I was mad and, and relieved at the same time. <laughs> Imagine a plain little piss having to pay five cents for I just couldn't get it through my head. It was unbelievable. We rode the streetcars to Oak Park after we left Alice and then walked a few miles to the great Proviso freight yard. The first man we met was the chief detective of the yard. He asked us for identification. We showed him the letter from Erna's mother telling of her illness, and the letter was an excuse for the trip. We offered to show him our marriage license, and he said it wasn't necessary as he believed us. He, he wished us luck on our home journey. There was uh, six other detectives there. He was a large, broad-shouldered man, and he wore a black suit and black hat. A big man with a big heart. He told us his name, and if any of the other detectives stopped us to tell them, he said it was okay. He instructed us to go to the siding number 62. You know, they had these reels, the siding where the freight trains were making up. They all had different numbers. He go to the siding number 62, and walked down the line of the cars until we came to a flat car with a large round tank in the middle. We were to sit in front of that tank. We did exactly as he said, and when the train pulled out, he was at the head of the yard waving his light at us. Both his duty and his conscience was fulfilled. In all walks of life, there are some good people. Thirty minutes later, at a water stop in West Chicago, we were accosted by another detective. He told us to get off the train as it was a manifest. Some trains had, were, had sealed and special cars. Railroads discouraged riders on those. He said another train would be along in about 20 minutes. He was walking on when he stopped and said, Say, is one of you a woman? 
are you married? We showed him our driver, our marriage license, and he was satisfied. I was forgetting off, but Ernest said, I don't think he'll put us off. I was standing beside the car when he returned down the other side of the track. He said, ain't you off that car yet? I replied, she wants to stay on. He came back with, lady, it's unhealthy to ride this train. Erna got off that car like it and suddenly turned hot. <laughs> Twenty minutes later, we boarded a freight that landed us in Clinton just at sunup. We were waiting for a train departure when we were approached by a heavy man, heavy set man who was prodding along looking like a bull going through a bog. When he got within yelling distance, he bellowed, get the hell out of this yard or I'll run you in. We left at once and joined about 20 others who were gathered on a little hill on a road that ran pa parallel to the railroad. Beside the Rager transients, there were two other married couples. One was an eight-year-old boy. That little hill was a sitting in a theater, and down below the fat detective had the stage all to himself. He lumbered up the track, throwing stones down into the thickets on both sides. Get the hell out of there! He got results. The crowd on the hill was going. We knew our rights. We were, we were on public property where his authority ended. One young fellow had a bruise on his cheek. I was about to ask if he was hit by one of the rocks when he put both hands around his mouth and shouted, I'm a nurse to come down there and show that gun up your big. I, I didn't notice him tell them that the dick was carrying a gun which he quickly raised and fired twice over our head. The huge thugs made swishing sounds through the air. One minute, that little hill was crowded with people, and the next was bare as a belly ball. <laughs> <laughs> when we stopped to catch our breath, I said that our only chance was to work our way around the yard, the railroad yard, and try to catch a train coming up. It was rough going and got worse. We came to a creek and there was a half submerged log partly across it. Erna went first and made it, but halfway over I slipped and went in. Erna yelled back, don't let the suitcase get soaked. In a crisis you can always depend on a woman to think of the important things. <laughs> We went to a cornfield and came out on the railroad track just as a freight was pulling out of the yard. We could see the fat man hanging on the side of the car. He dropped off at the yard's limit. I said, it's coming too fast. We'll never be able to make it. As the locomotive passed us, the engineer, engineer suddenly cut the steam and the train slowed to a crawl. Erna went up the car ladder first and I followed, just barely making it. The suitcase felt like a baby grand piano. <laughs> we were sitting on the car, car's catwalk when the, bake, when the bakery breaky made his jump from the engine to the caboose. He gave her a bag with two sandwiches and apple and thin. I thought I recognized you folks I told Ed, that's the same couple that came each with us two weeks ago. So Ed cut her down for you. We thanked him for the sandwiches and said we were grateful for Ed and his help. One thing our trip proved, the good people outnumber the bad. Knowing that makes it easier for one to face life's problems. We reached Waterloo, Iowa and stayed that night at the leader of the unemployed council and his family. After a big breakfast, we left on a westbound freight across the rolling hills of Iowa. We wa wasted several hours in Boone getting another train, as it was dark when we reached Carroll, just 30 miles from home. We, we found out we couldn't get another train until the next morning. 
We were out of money and the night was getting colder and we wanted to get home to the children. I mentioned riding the blinds but advised against it. Erna insisted we try. The blinds is a, is a vestibule in the baggage car right behind the locomotive. There's just room for a few to stand in front of the locked baggage car door. It was a dirt it was a dirty, windy, and dangerous ride at best. The rule is to get on after the train is in motion. As the train will put you off. Once you are on, they won't bother. We hid behind a small shed near the engine until we heard the two short toots, the signal for departure. We ran for the blinds only to find it crowded with transits. They had got on ahead of us, and there was no more standing room. I told Erna to climb up the ladder to the top of the water tender, which is just behind the engine. The top of the tender is flat, but there's a 3 inch rim around the outside. They had just taken on water, and the deck was soaking wet. We had no choice but to lie in the water and cover our eyes, nose, and mouth. This is necessary because the hot smoke contains tiny, sharp centers that cut the tender membranes of your lungs and cause you to split buds for a day or two. That, I've had that happen so many times to me. You put a handkerchief over your head and somewhere or other those little hot centers find their way into your lungs. Riding a locomotive is far different from riding the rest of the train. You feel a vibration and a power surge under you. At times you seem to float and there's a side to side rocking. You expect the engine to leave the rails at any moment. The Denver Express roared and shook with a piercing shriek at ever crossing. Smoke and cinders whipped about our face, but in less than 30 minutes we arrived at Denison. We climbed down the side opposite the paying customers and waited for the train to pull off, then walked across the track, and in less than a block, we were home. We washed off the suit and ate some hot soup. We washed off the soot and ate some hot soup. The next day, we would have our little family together. It felt good to be home. And the next day, we found Joe and Diane in perfect health and in good shape, and their grandmother hated to give them up. <laughs> there we was together, our family all together. We said, we're not going to separate again. And that's the end of this story. <laughs> Now, are you ready to go? Ready to go, Tim. Well, this is a kind of a pee story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, they give us a bath, Evelyn and I. We were the youngest in the family. My older sisters always give us a bath together. We had a great big galvanized tub. We'd sit in the tub, and they'd give us a bath and wash us over, and then towel us off, and that was it. But we always took a bath together. How old were these? Well... Uh, five or six, five years old, I think. Five, maybe four. My sister must have been five or six. And I was probably four. But I can remember like it was yesterday. <laughs> we're sitting in the tub and they were bathing us. And the water was warm and nice. And I felt like taking a pee. And whenever I felt like it, I did it in those days. <laughs> and so I started peeing, and it came up above the water and spurted up in a little U-shape, and my sister spotted it. And at the same time she spotted it, uh, Evelyn spotted it. And she says, Jada, Jada, Teddy's peeing in the water. <laughs> and boy, that, that washed it up. <laughs> And I just kept right on until I finished anyway, because I'd already started. And uh, boy, they grabbed her out, they grabbed Evelyn out, and they toweled her off and, and uh, cleaned her up, and they left me sitting in my pee, <laughs> looking at the water.
then finally they, they let me get out and then they threw the water away. But you know, it was interesting. Actually, that's, that's a common thing to do. You get in the water, and I did it before, but I always managed to keep it down under the water. But this time it had too much force, and it popped up in a little U-shape. And that was a betrayal, a dead giveaway. <laughs> I was caught with a good though, that one. I want to tell that to Evelyn when I go back to see her, oh, see if she remembers yeah. that. That might jog her up and bring her back to our world again. That'd be it great. It just might. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. That's it, Joe. <laughs>
when uh, those evolutions as a theory of life, oh no, I was in that thing when I chose uh, the evolutionary theory of life over the mystic creative theory. Growing up at a farm made it easy to accept what I believed to be the truth, as we were using evolution to produce better crops and livestock. With the evidence of every creature on earth, I wondered how anyone would be so blind as to accept the fantasies of some ancient writers of the Bible. A case in point is a butterfly. Now, this butterfly bears two black eyes of a predator on each wing. And uh, that's a warning to birds of prey and is necessary for its survival. Now, how did that butterfly develop this protection? Relig religious people will say some superhuman deity did it. That's a simple answer for simple minds. The truth is, there are two types of creatures, the eaters and those to be eaten. Nature and its zealous protection of all species through eons of time by trial and error developed an image on the, on the wing of that butterfly best suited to scare away the birds of prey. A simple evolutionary, evolutionary development for survival of the species. So when you see one of those butterflies, you know it didn't just come, somebody just didn't put those black round eyes on their wings. The disparity between price and cost in the agriculture and industrial system reached its peak in the late 20s. I've got to give you a little bit of history now. Unable to, unable to reach the huge debts and bills, farmers began to, began to lose their farms. Our farm went too. At the injustice of the economic imbalance, I became totally involved. My high school Debate team took up the issue, opting for federal assistance for the farmers. The help in the form of farms and subsidies was to come later, and now it's a boon to corporate and rich farmers. All the poor farmers is long gone. <laughs> in the search for a more fair economic system, I discovered socialism. Karl Marx, I, I quote, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. This was what I was looking for, a loving, caring, economic system for all mankind. I became a communist and dedicated my life for fighting for a socialist system. I don't have any regrets for my more than 20 years and the class struggle, as we called it in those days, the Soapsbach experiences, organizing labor unions, the strikes, the jails, and the beatings, for they taught me the true nature of most people. I know there are many good, kind, and loving people, but they are a minority. Most of the world's populace do not want a protective socialist a protective social system. They prefer the capitalist system with its selfish, greed, rapacious appetites, where the big ones eat the little ones, and the only worthwhile goal is to obtain great riches in any possible manner, and to hell with the poor, the old, and the weak. This raises an interesting question. Why didn't Karl Marx V.I. Lennon and Ted Bear and all the <laughs> other communists see the impossibility of removing the true nature of people by education. Very good question, you know. Yeah. 
The answer lies in the hidden survival genes deep within all of us. So solidly fixed, they can't be eliminated by education. They can only be restricted and controlled in order to adapt us to the laws of our society. So just what are we? We are animals, like all other animals, except that we have the power to think. And other animals depend on, is, are controlled by their instincts. How we gained the power to think is really simple. We were latecomers among other animals on this planet. And lucky for us, we were weaker and less prepared for combat, less endowed with proper fangs and claws. We were forced to create weapons to even the odds of survival. It required thinking to do this. To fix a stone on a, on a stick so you can reach out and hit the animal on the head that gives you an advantage. We become tool makers today, successful beyond our dreams. We rule the earth and all of its creatures. Thinking was not a gift, it was a necessary requirement for survival. The priests, the preachers, and the teachers, and the parents will drew with anticipation at the birth of a baby. There is a new brain theirs to mold into an upright and moral citizen. One to set a precedent for the, for the goodness of his, uh, in this evil world. In their eagerness to mess up the life of the new baby, they couldn't be more wrong. Already deep within that little body lies a full supply of, su supply of survival genes dating back thousands of years of impressionable living experiences which will guide and shape the kind of a person that baby will be. The parents and others can only tend to modify and restrain them. It's all set up ahead of their imaginations. At this point, I would like to relate a little story uh, to exemplify a possible origin of important genes. The greed instinct and the killer instinct. Immoral or illegal in our present societies, they were nevertheless very good and necessary in our ancient past. Or none of us would be here today. So you can see the importance of these genes to start with. And now this little story is a fight for survival. And I got to take you back to ancient times in the early ages of man. Winter came early that year. The hunting stopped when the animals left to seek warmer climes. The harvest of grain, nuts, and fruit had been a meager one. The clan huddled in their huge cave. They were facing hard times. Their enemy came in the night seeking to rub them, rob them of their food supply and steal the desirable females. The fight was fast and furious. The foes were beaten off. Both Mog and Og took part in the struggle. Recently mated Mog and Og's, Mog carrying Og's unborn baby Nevertheless, she helped Og kill his huge foe. Most of the women stayed out of the battle, but Mog pitched, pitched in with a first fist-sized rock and beat the enemy on the face and head until the blood ran around her fingers. When the huge body relaxed in death, a great feeling of triumph welled up in her breast. At that moment, a survival gene was born, the instinct to kill. The gene would stay and grow stronger down through thousands of generations. 
Nations would wage wars. Men would die in battle. An Irish patriot would shoot an English soldier. An Arab would kill a Jew. A crazed religious cult, cult not calling himself Jesus Christ, would shoot four government agents. Now that happened in Texas, and that was, remember yeah. that was back at that period of time uh, when that happened. A young woman would vote for capital punishment in California. The killer gene is alive and well. Clan, they, at that time, California got uh, voted in capital punishment, which isn't a detriment to uh, murder, as we found out. Most clan leader, no, clan leader Tor, Tor was his name, warned of their severe food shortage and ruled all would have to go on half rations until the winter ended. Mo whispered to Og, Mog whispered to Og, now Mog was the wife, you know. she whispered to Og on what they should do. Each day they smuggled a small amount of stored food and secreted it in a, to a hidden nook, known only to them. When death through starvation started, they moved into their secret place among the clan. Among the clan, they alone survived to build a wiser and stronger clan in the future. With them, the killer instinct and now the greed instinct survived and grew stronger down through the generations until one day a millionaire would strive to become a billionaire. A man owning one house would buy two more for investments. A little old lady in a checkout lane would search her purse for a misplaced food coupon. As the old saw puts it, there's a little bit of greed in all of us. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Bill? That's right. <laughs> it is true that hidden genes in us are moved into action under the stress of emotions. Therefore, it becomes of vital importance for everyone to control their emotions at all times and under any conditions. This is possible because we are thinking animals. We know the difference between right and wrong. Our conscience can guide us in the right choices. The survival genes have made us masters of the earth and all of its creatures. They have also given us the tools of destruction, which we use very efficiently. The fatal poisoning of the air, the land, and the sea are only a question of time. Doomsday for the human animal on this this planet cannot be first all forever. It can be delayed by the concerted action of concerned people. We must unite with the many dedicated people fighting to save our environment. We must join with those who are fighting against bigotry, racism, intolerance, and militarism. The end of man's short destiny on this planet Earth depends on the success of our efforts. That's all, Joe. I hope that I hope everybody Every family, you know, has one thing that might pop up. They have a retarded child. Some of the most intelligent people have these retarded child, and it's just a happenstance of nature. Something goes wrong in the process of making that baby, and he comes out retarded. Well, in my time, there was no place for these people to be, these retarded ones, except in the home. They were kept in the home, and people put up with them. And you could drive through the countryside, and you'd see them peeking at you from around the end of a <laughs> barn or behind a tree or or through some window they pull a curtain back because uh, 
the retarded people have a tendency to keep away from others. And this was especially true in my my uh, cousins and my dad, and uh, that was my great uncle Sam who went through the Civil War and was wounded in the Battle of Gettysburg, went through seven big battles of the Civil War and lived to be 97 years old. And uh, he had a normal family, but they never married. Uh, Bill and Bruce and Ida and Ed all stayed single, and John, well, I, I, what I'm going to talk about is John. John was a mishap. He was a retarded one. And in those days, they used to call him half-wit or, or weak-minded people or whatever, you know. They had a lot of different words for it. But anyway, John had the same peculiarity that most of those people have. He liked to keep away from others. He liked to hide, in other words. And, uh, I was always looking forward to the time we'd go over for dinner at Dad's cousin's, at Uncle Sam's, so I could see where John was hiding. And he always had different hiding places. I'd go walking out of the orchard, and he'd be about 60 to 80 feet away looking at me from behind a tree. Or he'd be behind a, a stump or, or some building. But he was always keeping his eye on me. And I used to make kind of a game out of it. I got a little fun out of that, I'll have to admit. Poor guy. But anyway, uh, one time we went and we had a, went for a dinner. And I think it was Thanksgiving or something because boy, that table was really spread with food. And uh, Ida was a wonderful cook. She was the one that used to chew the back and spit down oh, between yeah. her boots, yeah, but, <laughs> but anyway, she was still a good cook. And uh, so anyway, we was all gathered together at the table eating this big, beautiful feast, and I felt eyes on me. Did you ever have that feeling? You know, yeah. somebody's looking at you and you don't know where. And I figured, well, the only thing it could be is John, but where could he hide? There ain't no place in here he could hide. And then I looked over my left shoulder, and the door had stood open, and there was a little corner that the door covered, that little corner. And then right between that head space, which is only about an inch and a half, I looked, and there was an eye staring out <laughs> through that space right at me. <laughs> and at first, before I knew it was John, the chills ran up and down my back. But now, you know, it. John wasn't supposed to have been intelligent, but it must have, he must have used a little intelligence to figure out that hiding place. Yeah. It was a perfect hiding place. And the door and everything, everything stood natural. But there he was, had his eyes on me. And I, just an ordinary kid, I guess I waved up, I waved at him. <laughs> I don't know what he thought about that. But you see, he couldn't go no place because he was in that corner and he had to wait till the meal was over. And then he could sneak out. Yeah. But anyway, the poor guy died when he was 53 years old, see? Uh, he couldn't take care of himself like other people. In other words, he couldn't learn what was good for his body and what uh -huh. was bad. And he probably just eat to the wrong kind of foods and stuff like that, and he didn't live too long. Yeah. But he had a happy life, and I'll tell you why he had a happy life. Because he could do as he damn pleased in that family. And the funny thing about it, that family were pretty smart. You know, Bruce was the head guy in the in the biggest bank in the county. Mm -hmm. He was he was right up on the top of that bank, and Ed was an engineer That's that got known all over the country for his great. ability. And Bill, they were all smart, but uh, that one one bad link in the family. But anyway. I always liked that John, the way we played hide and seek together. <laughs> well, so much for that. I yeah. want to get into this story. Now, which one we, we want to use? Well, whichever one is. So you have plenty of time to. So you well, I want to use this, this nurse made for a banana story. Good. I ought to tell about that. Uh, 
this, I had a lot of screwed off jobs because I was in the communist movement and I didn't no more and get a job and I'd get fired for, from it. But anyway, I, I, I got a job as banana messenger. And this is a true experience. I kept a, a diary on these trips, so I knew exactly what happened. This was 1937. I was working part-time uh, for the Western Fruit Express Company, checking the fruit cars, you know, that held all kinds of fruit. They had to be iced in the, uh, the summertime. Yeah. In the winter, we had to, we had the little uh, fire. Where was this? Two cubes to to put a uh, uh, flame in the reefers. Where was to keep this, the Ted? Cars warmer, yeah. yeah. Where was this? This is in Sioux City, Iowa. Sioux City, Iowa. My job was checking and maintenance the refrigerator and fruit cars, icing them in the summer and supplying heat in the winter. The fruit company banana agent offered me a job as banana messenger. While becoming an expert, Working with bananas, plantations in South America, he contracted malaria. That malaria has funny effects on people. It affects their minds, which we all thought made him a little goofy. He certainly was a little goofy, but he was a good guy. He did his job perfectly, perfect on his job. The job paid well. This banana vester job played well, so I took it. I think it was $6.50 an hour, which is wow. darn good, you know, well, that time. I would es escort two cars of bananas to all points north, out of Sioux City. Sioux City was the division part. The last leg of their long journey. See, they come from South America, mostly mm -hmm. from Colombia, and uh, some of those other countries. Uh, I would break the seals. I would have to break the seals on the on the train on the car and check the fruit, testing the temperature by putting a thermometer into the pulp of the banana. The heat varied between 65 and 70 degrees. The order would state 25 percent on destination went, meant, went one fourth of the bananas turning yellow. And I had to adjust the heat according to, accordingly and then send a telegram and code to the agent. Everything had to be exactly right for that suspicious character. He once told me, don't talk to anyone. Our competitors as spies all around. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that guy. He was a question, I'll tell you. Well, one time our train got stopped by a snow blizzard near Watertown, South Dakota. While we waited for the snow removal, I supplied the, the crew up in the caboose See, the brakies and, and the engineer, they all come back to the caboose. That's their living quarters on the train. I supplied the crew in the caboose with bananas and coconuts. I didn't wear the agent about that. <laughs> <laughs> the day when checking off a list of I loaded here in South Dakota a smog. Oh, I got to say some more about those bananas. Uh, I could pick enough of ripe bananas, you see, turning yellow, so that they were happy to eat those bananas. But there's about 60 bananas in a bunch, and there's 60 bunches of bananas in a car. So I had to select those bananas very carefully <laughs> out of the bunch, so they appear that they were, wasn't any missing. Uh, I didn't, you know, uh, then they we're checking off. I was checking off the load at Huron, South Dakota. A long green snake fell out one of the stems. We call them banana bunches stems. Fell out of the stem carried by one of the workers. Being in rattlesnake country, 
they naturally thought it was poisonous. No one would pick up another stem. Everybody went to a nearby, someone went to a nearby school for a snake expert who came immediately to our relief. He said it was non-poisonous. He gave us its name, which we immediately forgot. <laughs> he also told us they lived on plantations, making their nests in the fruit stems. The remarkable thing was that Snake stayed secure in his cozy nest all that long journey. We gladly donated the snake to the high school. <laughs> I had worked three months and was beginning to like the job when the boom fell. I, I uh, used all my spare time in helping out the packing house workers strike. I had started and edited the Swift Packing House Workers News, a weekly paper. That made me an honorary member of the union for volunteer work. I was at the strike headquarters talking to my two capable sausage girls, girls from the sausage department who did the typing and mimeographing of the paper when the banana agent stormed through the door. I never saw a man so angry. Your, your, banana, uh, your banana car left left the city and there is no one with them, he screamed. I wasn't notified, I said. He leaped at me and yelled, you are fired. At the same time he jerked the pulp thermostat out of my bib pocket of my overalls, tearing my overalls. I didn't care about the thermometer, but it was a new pair of overalls. I said to the girls, looks like I'm fired. Oh, well, I'm through playing nursemaid to a bunch of bananas anyway. <laughs> that was my ego talking. I really needed that job and had got to liking it. The strike was soon settled, and I left Sioux City for a better place to make, make a living, or so I thought. <laughs> <laughs> That's a banana story. Okay. Well, anyway, anyway, uh, uh, I, I uh, had a lot of experiences, and I don't regret anything, because in all of this thing, you, you learn about people, see? Yeah. And when I think back to that agent, if I was in his position, his responsible position, I'd done exactly like he did. <laughs> So when I think about it, I don't regret having him spoil my overalls. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. hey, can we start the other story? Yes, if you want to. Well, do you think we have time? Sure. We have about 20, about 20 minutes left, Ted. There's 20. Yeah. Oh, that's enough, I think. Yeah, I think so. Hey, let's put the friendly skies on. No, I wanted to put the boiler on there. I think that's the better one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a better story. Okay, all right. Yeah, and, uh... Okay. Well, is it ready to go? It's ready it to is. go. It is? It's on. Okay. Well, anyway, this story is about fate. Well, it's about, uh, it's about me and fate. But anyway, it's a very interesting story because it's a period of time when things are different than they are now. Now, the thing that, the thing that uh, is interesting is uh, the period of time. See, at this time, the Power energy was all steam. That was the greatest energy of power that we had. And so it became necessary for us to learn how to use that power. And this is a period that caught me with that, with questions. I didn't know uh, about it when I started in, but I learned pretty fast. Fate shapes 
everything in this universe, including humans. Fate has kept me alive for 89 years, and I have had my share of calls. Now, I want to tell one thing. It seemed like a shock has saved me more times than anything else. So I got to tell about this. Uh, at eight months old, sick and with pneumonia, my mother cried to my father, this child is dead. Now, you know, it's a very interesting thing. She threw me into my father's chest. Mm -hmm. And uh, by, I was white and she thought I was dead. And apparently it started my heart beating again. Hmm. And then the same thing happened when I had a hat. The guy, the professional, the doctor, the specialist in the hospital, told me what happened to my operation. When I got uh, electrocuted with this saw, I felt now the electric electricity had stopped my heart. And I fell 12 feet and hit the floor. And that shock started my heart again. So apparently, shocks has saved my life a couple of times. Well, anyway, i got to read this. At eight months old, sick with pneumonia, my mother cried to my father, this child is dead. Since then, I have the boxes, two scaffold falls with injuries, a watery grave in Lake Michigan, and steam, two steam boiler explosions. Now here is the story of the steam explosions. It was, the year was 1925. I was 17 years old. My brother Robert had a thrashing machine outfit. We went around thrashing 15 to 20 farms. And we always started at our place because that's where the equipment was. We saw that everything was okay thrashing at our place. Uh, he tended the separator. That's the main, most important thing about the thrash machine. Mm -hmm. Because you have to be sure the grain has been knocked out of the bundles, you know, and, they, and it doesn't go into the straw and stuff like that. So it's a very important position, that separator. And he taught me to operate the case steam engine. On the bottom of the boiler, right over the firebox of the case engine, was a thick iron plate called the crown sheet. In the back was a three inch iron plug made so soft it would melt out in case no water was on the sheet. The plug saved our lives. The engine slanted as we were coming down a long hill. Boy, that was a long hill. Water ran off the crown sheet towards the front of the engine, and the crown sheet become red hot and melted out the soft plug. And when we hit the bottom, that soft plug went out. And, and we got a few burns from the steam, otherwise we was unhurt. But we made a mistake right there. We replaced the soft plug, we didn't have another one, with a solid steel, a steel one, which unknown to us at that time, set up the solid That was a mistake we shouldn't have made. The next season we started threshing on our home farm as we had only oats that year. Oats season, seasons faster than wheat in the shop. I was 18 and thought I knew it all. by my first owner, which would be followed by several others in my lifetime. Now, injectors were used to put water into the boiler. We had two of them in case one failed, the other one, and this time both of them failed. One of them was called Penberth, I never forgot that name, and the other the U.S. And the injector was made so that when the water came in, the steel was in a trap. But when the water hit that trap, it opened and held the steam back while the water flowed into the boiler. And that's the only way you'd get water in the boiler. But they were temperamental, just like humans are. 
One time it'll work good, and the next time it won't work. So we had two of them. And if one didn't work, the other one generally would. And this time, neither one of the damn things worked. Huh. It was late afternoon, almost 6 o'clock. And we were at only about 30 minutes to finish. The water was down to one inch in the glass cage. That was the thing I had to watch, that glass cage. It was supposed to be about four or five inches up, and it was down to a half inch. I thought it would be okay, but just in case, I moved to sit on the big six-foot traction wheel on the side. Two fellows were drinking water from the 10-gallon milk can back of the engine. See, the why he kept that water back then the engine? Because there wasn't any dust around the engine. Mm -hmm. So the guys could get off their wagons when they brought their bundle racks in and get off and have a drink of water, see? And not have a bunch of dust to, to breathe. Well, anyway, they were sat in there drinking when the firebox of the door, firebox of a fire door blew open like a cannon blast. And steam and hot coals poured out of there. And the two water drinkers, they hit those water drinkers. I don't think they were burned very bad, but they must have been burned some. But they decided to depart immediately. i never seen guys run so fast in my life. And I didn't get too good a look at them because I was falling down to get my face against the ground to keep get, getting burned from the steam. I rolled off the wheel and laid flat on the ground and put my hands over my head and pulled my hat down to escape from the steam. When the steam cleared away, we found that the stay bolts, that's the bolts that hold the boiler together, that holds the boiler together had pulled loose from the sagging crown sheets, which become red hot, of course, allowing the steam to escape through the holes. And that's the only thing that saved us. If the boiler casing had fragmented like a dozen blow-ups, I wouldn't be here to tell this story. Fate is tricky sometimes. Yes, it is. It wasn't that case. Well, I got to... The engine boiler was a hopeless mess. But here again, fate intervened. In our hometown, there was a small, dark-skinned blacksmith called, everybody called him the Ration. I never knew what his name was. He said he, he had a face almost as black as a Negro's and looked like leather. And he was a little bit of a damn guy, like a dwarf almost. He said he could fix it anyway. Boy, he was strong, though. The tough, wiry little man who crawled into that firebox which was less than three and a half feet square, and with his hammer and torch, heated that iron sheet, and and uh, heated that iron sheet back up until the stay bolts, and hammered and beat it back up until the stay bolts came through, and then he welded them. It took him three days and he charged $500 which my brother Bob was glad to pay. Fate give us the one man who could and would do that tremendous job. I tried to call in that boiler, that firebox, and I couldn't even get in. Mm -hmm. And I'm a medium-sized person. But that little fellow got in there and done that terrible work. The only guy probably in the whole world, including Rachel, where he come from, that could do that was there to do it. Faith is like a keen blade of steel. It strikes without mercy or reasoning at any object by chance. When it gets around to calling time on me, as it does to all things, I will have no complaint, having outlived so many others more deserving than I. So I say enjoy the good life. Every minute is precious. Yeah, that, that's an interesting story, and I'd really have to think about it. Yeah.
This story is about uh, a job, an odd job that I had during my career that had some interesting consequences. And uh, I, I want to, and I kept a, a just track of everything that happened just as it did. You know, the turbulent Missouri River, it has always been a trouble maker for anyone involved with it. Missouri River has a tendency of cutting banks and moving back and forth. They used to say an Iowa farmer would work up in Nebraska and have a, be a Nebraska farmer after a couple of day, eight days of the Missouri River. And uh, that's no, probably the truth. The rules of soil between Nebraska and Iowa was as easy victim to the Wild River washing away wool farms in a few days. The story was an Iowa farmer awoke one morning to find he was a citizen of Nebraska. That's it. <laughs> I didn't tell that quite right. At any rate, the government engineers in 1937 were going to put a stop to the river wandering of putting down a huge maze of mats to come constrict the current. They were hiring help and I needed a job. My good friend Harry Gerstyle, who owned a dry goods store, staked me with leather gloves and work clothes. On the list of jobs was that of a weaver. I didn't know what it was, but it was the highest paid. So I told the hiring boss that I was a weaver. He gave me a skeptical look, but he hired me. And the huge mat consisted of the huge mat consisted of 16 foot long, one by four boards woven in a basket weave, four inch in four inch spaces, tied by steel cables. This was sunk in the river bottom by huge rocks. The mat was on 100 foot wide and stretched from shore 600 feet into the river. The weavers worked in pairs. We would grab a board off the pile and run to the protruding fingers of the boards. Fingers of the boards protruded out and were four inches apart. They, uh, they're up to four inches, Matt, and then get away fast. When, once we got away, we weaved it back and forth in these fingers, 10 or 12 fingers, and once we got, we done that, we got away fast because there were others coming right behind us, you see. I wasn't fast enough. The next board came in behind me and I heard the foreman yell, pinch him. They did. Then they relaxed and let me out. I was black and blue from my knees to my butt. I thought since I didn't know the tricks, that will come later. The only way is more speed. I never got pinched again and I become a weaver. A, a skull on which we weaved the mat was moved by a capstan with a cable across the river. It was separated by four men. It was operated by four men to push on the wooden staves. One day, a stave broke off, and a worker fell headlong into the river. We stopped working for 15 minutes when he fell in. It it it, it, it seemed the right thing to do. It was on the top side of the mat, and the current sucked him right underneath. Mm -hmm. So he was down under the mat, you see. And there'd be no help for him. It meant certain death. Unfortunately, he was upriver to the mat and he surfaced under it. It was hopeless. The, the mat was already six inches under underwater when he went under. Nevertheless, we waited over the mat looking for his body. It came up two days later a little downstream. I worked as a weaver until the government 
contract expired, and I felt I was a bona fide weaver. <laughs> that's that's a weaver's job. That's great. I, I, that, I knew I had lunch with ate lunch with that Frenchman that drowned though, young fella, and he's hard hard to find jobs, and he found the job, and he's so tickled to death to get that job. He was really all he could talk about was the work he was doing. He was really enthusiastic. I think he was wiring some of the cables or something. And that's all he could talk about. And then to meet a fate like that, see, but that's life, you know. Yeah, it might have been better if he got drunk like you did and then you lost the job because of it, you know? Well, yeah. <laughs> the ferry. <laughs> uh, Ted, there, well, yeah. Yeah. there, there is about, uh, let's see, there's about uh, three Three minutes left, so if you'd like to make any concluding remarks to your grandchildren or daughters or anything, you got about three minutes, and then it's, it's, the tape is done. Well, I, you know, I haven't got too much to say outside of these stories that I have, but, you know, I'll tell you, there's one thing I would like to say, and that whatever you do, whatever you make up your mind to do, put your mind to it, do the best you can. This is the best way for you, and it's the best way for everybody concerned. Put all you got to into it. And I would had to learn all these jobs because I'd get fired from one job and I'd have to take another one, and I'd have to learn all over again. But I persevered. I just kept learning till I could learn everything there was about it and done the best I could. And maybe that wasn't good enough in some cases. But anyway, it's the best thing for you and for everybody concerned. Put everything you got into it and work towards learning everything there is to know about that particular thing at that time. Yep. And no matter how much knowledge you get, it can be useful in future years to you. So this is the only thing I got to leave with my yeah, ancestors. Man. Put everything you got into it and see it through to a finish. What I want to know is, is what's your secret for dealing with people? What? What is your secret for dealing with people, known or unknown, relatives or friends or enemies? What's the great secret? How you deal with them? Yeah. You have to take people the way they are. That's A lot of times, you don't like to. You'd like to have them be like you. But there's no way. Everybody is different. And you accept a person the way he is and let it go at that. And don't try to change them. That's an impossible task. A lot of women have wasted their whole lives trying to change men. Yep. <laughs> and they haven't succeeded. Yeah. Let them do their thing, but try to get along with them. Because after all, we're all living together in this all mixed up world with all the hatreds against people against people. And uh, some of the closest people hate each other the worst. That's a peculiarity of our, uh, of our thing. It's hard to believe, but the ones living closer to her are the biggest enemies. The worst fight I ever saw was two brothers. They almost killed each other in a fight. So, you know, that's the way it is. You have to take people the way they are. Yeah, that's, that's why you take me as I am and I take you as you are. That's why and we don't still... don't try to change either one of us. That's why we still get along, right, Ted? That's the great that's secret. Right. That's good. Okay, yeah. well, that's wonderful. Well... There's one more sip in there, and I think that uh, dinner is almost on the table, so that, that's wonderful because we have a two-hour tape yeah, of your you stories. Well, you good cheese and crackers. <laughs> I'm full already. <laughs> Just eating the cheese and crackers. Okay, Ted. <laughs>